Welcome to the Rooted Healing Podcast, where we seek to deepen our kinship with the living world and with the great mystery that runs through us. This is a space where stories heal with words that weave us closer to our wild and daring natures, bringing together the expansive minds, topics, and ideas that help us heal, reimagine, and co-create the world we wish to thrive in. Why wasn't I present? It always comes back to awareness. We are gifted this amazing thing called life. It's incredible that you and I are right here, right now, alive. It's it's like way better than winning the lottery. It's like, what are the chances of a universe that's billions of years old that we are here having this experience? So that is incredible. So <laughs> don't squander it, you know? And, and a lot of people feel that at end of life that they that they regret that they weren't here enough. Tree is an author, dream guide, and death doula who works in the esoteric realms of dreams, death, and divination. Her published books, Dreams, How to Connect with Your Dreams to Enrich Your Life, and Conscious Dreamer are both deeply insightful, fascinating reads, weaving science with anecdotal dream guidance from someone who has clearly ventured across her own inner landscapes with deep curiosity. Tree works closely with onerogens, dreaming plants and herbs as part of her conscious dreaming practice and facilitates workshops and ceremonies to connect people more deeply into their dream work alongside explorations with plant consciousness. Tree's work as a death doula or end of life guide involves helping people spiritually, emotionally, existentially and practically at the end of their lives, holding the space for healing, peace, support and compassion during the profound and sacred time of dying. Tree has also studied with the Aleph Trust in psychedelics, altered states and transpersonal psychology, which is exciting because I am starting a master's in consciousness and transpersonal psychology this year with the same university. I am fascinated by Tree's work and these topics. This conversation is a long one, but absolutely worth staying tuned in for the whole thing as Tree's stories and insights will seriously get you thinking about life in a new way. I had many goosebump moments and felt myself in deeper relationship with everything after we recorded this episode. We are doing a giveaway, so stick around till the end to find out how you can enter. Tree is also gifting her workshop, Death and the Psychopomp, to our patron listeners, which you can join from £1 a month by heading to patreon.com slash rootedhealing. So here it is, Tree Carr on lucid dreaming, dying and waking. Welcome, Tree. Oh, it's so wonderful to have you here. You, everything you do, I'm just incredibly enchanted by and fascinated in. And these are all topics that I've been exploring myself, dream work and even death and lucidity, conscious dreaming, conscious exploration. So I'm really excited to be in conversation with you now. Thank you. It's amazing and a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to talk about all things. Amazing. Yeah, I've got an abundance of questions. So I guess it would be nice to start at the beginning and understand a bit more about how you interacted with dreams as a child. And maybe you can talk us through those early years and how they might have shaped your capacity to adventure into dreamscape so intensely. Yeah, so I, as a child, I was born in the early 1970s, and I was spending my formative years on a commune in a communal living situation with my family and other families. And part of my upbringing, too, was no access to television or radio or pop culture. So there was a lot of access to outside and being outside, being able to be a kid playing instruments, drawing, reading. And so a very different environment than, you know, than most of us experience now where we're plugged into our our smartphones and laptops and televisions and and pop culture. So um, I was quite sheltered in that sense. So I think it had quite an impact on my inner worlds and also my dreams. 
And my earliest memories, actually, when I was a child, were of dreams that I had. So those felt more memorable than actually what was happening in my waking life. Of course, I remember lots of things in the waking life too, but but they seem to stand out more, the dreams and also like the lucid dreaming experiences and the the out-of-body experiences as a little kid. And probably my earliest memories are, I remember being in like in my crib, like I remember my mobile, I remember wearing an, like a, a nappy, a diaper. So my memories go really far back. But the, the first dream experiences were lucid dreams because I was conscious and aware and I was flying through space and having all of, you know, a lot of flying dreams. And it, it just felt like that's, that, that was something that I could do. Like that was part of, that's part of reality was being able to do that. Um, of course, it, I, I did differentiate when I was really little that it wasn't, you know, reality in terms of like my, I could just go and fly, jump out of a tree and fly. But I was very aware of the sense that there's a part of me that is conscious and that has perception and that has experiences that's able to do that. And I knew that I was able to do that just before I went to bed. So it was always on the threshold state as fall, like falling into sleep, that that's where the adventures would start. So I always looked forward to those moments of just laying in bed and I was really little. This is pre before, you know, kids go into school. So it must have been like three, four, five years old and having those experiences. And so it just really started there, really, you know, just having this awareness. I had a, a like a really strange sense of awareness and observation as a little kid, too. Just like observing things a lot, mostly probably because I wasn't sat in front of your television mm -hmm. and, you know... So I was out in nature all the time and I remember really looking, like having memories of really looking at uh, like mushrooms, like puff ball mushrooms and playing with, playing in trees and memories of like my favorite trees and memories of insects and, you know, the natural world, <clears throat> but also memories of just being really aware also, like of my own physicality and how weird it was. <laughs> like spending lots of time just looking at my feet <laughs> as a really little kid and just being like, wow, that, I'm, this is so weird. I'm in this very strange fleshy body. And I felt like I would really trip myself out by really observing so long and so intently, like for example, at my feet, that I would create this disassociation feeling of of I'm pure consciousness observing this avatar that I'm in. So I played, that, that That was kind of like a fun game to play at, when I was a kid. But I didn't realize that I was actually being really like, quite like a consciousness explorer and really knew the difference between conscious awareness in my physical body and like knowing how to jump into these t different states of consciousness as a child. So it all started there really, but I think that that, my formative up, my my formative years and the upbringing that I had probably had a big play on that because I wasn't distracted. I didn't have TVs and you know there certainly was no internet in the early seventies at all. <laughs> yeah, I am worried about how young children are with screens now and how normal it is just to put children in front of screens. I can literally feel how the things we are it putting into our brains through the screen is kind of clogging up the pineal gland it does for me for sure you know if I find myself rolling into habits of being on social media a little bit too much or just spending way too much time on the screen that I know I shouldn't be I definitely feel that that access portal is clogged <laughs> I love talking about lucidity. I was a lucid dreamer from a very young age. I, the, the earliest dreams I can remember still very clearly that I had some consciousness and control with were being in a nightmare and being able to squeeze my eyes shut tight and squeeze my whole face and clench my whole body and change the dream. And sometimes I would have to do this a few times, like changing a TV channel until I got to a dream that felt safe, that I could explore. That's so good. 
That's, and that's a really great way of start, like becoming initiated into conscious dreaming and, and lucid dreaming. It often is through scary dreams. It's often through nightmares. And then uh, being able to, you know, realize that you're in the dream and make the changes or, or you know, co start co-creating. So that's wonderful that you've experienced that. And uh, I had the same too, you know, I would transform the dream in some kind of way or escape the predator in some kind of way, like transforming into a, a butterfly or an animal or flying away. So it's, it's great that, you know, ch children have it naturally, it seems. Yeah, and I've noticed how as I've grown older, I've become more aware of my own limiting beliefs within my lucid dreams, or that the dream is demanding me to pay more attention rather than to control it and manipulate it. I recently had a lucid dream where I was following the clues and I was really, this was after the retreat, so I felt like it was quite activated from our time together. I was really trying to take in everything that could happen and I was almost willing kind of crazy things to happen but at one point I decided that I'd done a lot of focused work and I wanted to go flying and I leapt out of this castle tower and I tried to turn myself into an eagle but I could only half turn into this eagle. I sort of grew some feathers but I was still very much casting a human shaped shadow across the landscapes and I remember landing down on the ground and feeling this message come to me of like no this isn't what this dream is about and you touched upon this briefly at the retreat I'm wondering if you could speak to this now how lucid dreaming can be an amazing practice to expand our consciousness and how we're not necessarily um, supposed to just control it and have a wonderful time although I think that in itself is very expansive so yeah can you speak to that yeah, so there's so much potential in lucid dreaming. And in layman's terms, a lucid dream is a style of dream phenomenon where you become awake and conscious within the dream itself. So the dreamer has something happen in the dream that's surreal or surprising. And then they they think, wow, what is this? I'm dreaming. This is just a dream. And when you're in a dream in that sense, it becomes so real. It's um, like it's like a virtual reality, but a more organic form of virtual reality. And often dreamers will immediately try to start controlling the dream and, and flying around and, you know, having adventures. And of course, everyone wants to fly and, you know, create things out of, no of nowhere. But then sometimes it doesn't work and it feels as though the, the dream uh, blocks you from doing that or the dream starts dissolving or you try to fly but it's not quite working it's awkward and so I always encourage uh, dreamers when they start going down the the path of lucid dreaming is is to more or less co-create within the dream space itself um, and it's it's more about the co-creating and the co partnership with the dream consciousness than it is about controlling the dream so for example, going lucid and really wanting to fly, but but maybe just changing up and say, dream, take me somewhere. The dream will fly you somewhere. So sometimes it's like about surrender and allowing for this wonderful relationship between yourself and the dream to unfold. And I think that that's probably what can get you a little bit further in your expansion of consciousness because the dream is there the dream wants to teach you and show you something. When we, when our desires and our maybe ego intentions come in and say, but I want to make this hot celebrity manifest before me so I can start making out with them and it's not working. It's just, well, you know, I mean, that's all fun. I've did that a lot when I was a teenager, not with celebrities, but just with dream characters. But you know, and that's a natural part of the evolution of your dreaming too, is, is exploring that stuff too, of course. But there's great potential when you when you surrender to the dream, you start seeing the dream as a teacher in its own right. That's when you get the real epiphanies of insight uh, and, and downloads. And so, yeah, just calling out to the dream, take me somewhere, teach me something. I want to learn something show or show me something. That's when it gets really interesting. Mm, yeah. I'm curious what your approach to then analyzing dreams is, who has been your biggest influence or have you been working primarily intuitively from your own inner landscape exploration? 
Yeah, so I've just worked intuitively since I was a child. My parents have been really great guides in the sense that they've always listened to their dreams. Uh, they, they've had precognitive dreams. They've experienced that. So when I was young and also a teenager experiencing my dreaming worlds becoming more intense, they, they listened and they, they didn't uh, stigmatize it or shut it down in any kind of way. So my parents have been amazing in that respect. But I never wrote, read any books on dreaming. I've never, I never followed any paths or lineages. I just intuitively developed my own practice. I started journaling when I was a teenager in the 80s, and that really helped me get to grips with the different types of dreams I was having. There was no word for lucid dreaming in the 80s as far as I knew. There probably were, there probably were books, but I didn't know. So I would catalog the different styles of dreams I had, the, the, the lucid dreams, I just said wake up, the wake up dreams, precognitive dreams. And, and so I, I started on my own lineage and it wasn't until much later, the advent of, of the internet, but not, not even then, I, did, I didn't have any like, any framework for uh, certain um, lineages. So this is really funny. I got asked to, to write my first book. And as I was writing my first book, of course, you have to reference a lot of things. You need to bring in references uh, quite a bit and do your research. So it was through writing my first book that I discovered that there was all of these dream lineages out there. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow. So I'm really embarrassed to say that the, you know, the first time I ever heard of like Tibetan dream yoga and all that lineage. And the first time I heard of like Carlos Castaneda's and like the Toltec traditions and mm. That that was the first time I heard learned of all of these lineages, and so um, yeah, I never followed any lineages. It was just through my own my own intuition and all just my my family, just like my my parents, and that's it. Mm, I I love that you had family who could really share dreams with you and receive your dreams because that has been a big grief of mine. And Francis Weller talks about this in the World Edge of Sorrow. This kind of need that our soul perhaps has to wake up and have a whole community or a whole village looking at us saying what did you dream you know and having that space to really share our dreamscapes that in a way that brings us closer together and you said something during our retreat to do with the health and happiness of a community based on how they were sharing their dreams yeah that's right and it was studies done with the Sinoi tribe and Studies showed that their dream sharing practices that they did every day, the dream sharing would be led by the children and the children would share first and then the elders would share. And they found that the dreaming sharing practice that this community engaged in correlated with the fact that this community had effectively no depression, no anxiety, and people were really well integrated emotionally. And it makes a lot of sense because the dreams are the realms of the unconscious mind and also the deep emotive content that we, we, we store and we squish down. And so if you're able to every day, you know, speak about what was popping up in the dreams, which is, you know, it could be concerns, it could be emotional territory, but it also could be precognitive territory that, or wisdom or guidance that can help with the, your community, your family members then this is going to make for a more integrated person, a more integrated kinship group, you know? And mm -hmm. so I always found that those studies were really interesting. And I, to this day, I really encourage the practice of dream sharing. And as you've seen in our retreat, we were doing that in the mornings. And what ha happens, and we only did, you know, did it for, for maybe like three, three mornings or, or four mornings or whatever over the retreat, but what ended up happening is people become a, a lot more connected. The, the interconnectivity of everyone starts to really be shown. People start appearing in each other's dreams. People's dreams help other people. So like I could be sharing mm -hmm. one dream and the messages of the dream and you can see like people's faces light up. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, you know, like that's going to help me. That information helps me. And also it helps uh, other people who's in our retreat, there was um, 
you know, some of the attendees dreamt of each other and there was lovely healing messages that were, were there and supported the others. And um, it gets phenomenal when you start working in group settings this way. Mm. Uh, yeah, there needs to be more studies on that. I think it's very understudied, but it's definitely very helpful for mental health and well-being. Yeah, you could see the coherence that was happening between the group in such a short space of time, even in whether it was dreams or just visions that were coming through the breath work we were doing. But they were they were similar visions. People were having the same stuff come through and these patterns. And both myself and Hannah, another attendee, we had the same vision of this beautiful big tree of life come through. And I can only imagine that if you're literally living in a village or a community where there's a practice around that kind of sharing and appreciation of the inner worlds that it must just be yeah completely magical and guiding absolutely and there's been you know history has shown too that you know when the the um, conquests and the the colonialism happened uh, back and over in the americas and a lot of the um, experiences especially in South America and also in Mexico, mostly Spanish monks recording their experiences. They made note that the people, the indigenous peoples and the people who are living in these very simple ways in dream sharing and and in communities, that they noticed that the indigenous people were very in touch with their emotions. And it's noted that men, women and children all equally alike you know, would cry, would show joy, would all uh, process emotions in very, you know, public, not like public, yeah, just very natural ways. And they, they didn't suppress anything. And I always find that very interesting because it's very different, um, you know, in the modern industrialized capitalist system, we have real problems with not being in touch with our emotions, repressing them and and having very poor health as a result. Uh, So I think that, you know, the dream sharing, which we probably all did at one point, because it's not just indigenous cultures and shamanic cultures. It it was everyone, even, you know, even the white cultures, you know, really, if you go far back enough, the thread of shamanism and these very person-centered ways of being and community ways of living was everywhere. It's like that. That's how everyone lived, um, and dreams were taken tra- taken seriously. Dreams were seen as something to be heralded, something to to listen to, something to process. But it's just been you know in the advent of the modern world where dreams are just shrugged off as junk data and residual images that are just reveries and don't make you know your brain is washing out the junk from the day before. I I still see science writing that in, in blogs and articles all the time. It's like, (laughs) like, yeah, sure. There's probably some part of that happening, but they, they totally bypass the fact that dreams are experiences of consciousness in the altered state of sleep. And they bypass that dreams are important processing for emotions, emotional well being. Uh, the unconscious, and then there's also the space of the unknown too, which still is very understudied. So, you know, precognition um, (laughs) and so many other interesting dream phenomenon that people do experience. Mm. Yes, yes. (laughs) It's like the same thread that um, 70% of our DNA is just junk DNA it's kind of like this we just don't understand it yet we shouldn't just be disregarding in these experiences I find when I really work with a dream I can spend um, an hour or two in that moment kind of analyzing and getting deep deep insight but then I can find a week later something through else will come through from that particular dream and then I might even find months later like oh wow okay that's what was going on and it's deep therapy can we talk about archetypal energy because I find it so fascinating and I cannot really comprehend it so well like how do you think it manifests and what do you think archetypal existence and images and story what that tells us about our very nature yeah 
So the archetypes, the archetypes are, are great and universal themes and symbols that hold characteristics that seem to shine the light of awareness on our journey as a human being. Our, as human beings, we, we move through the journey of life and we come across lots of different characters and themes and we can become those characters and themes. We could have a chapter in life where we're a hero or a villain or we're a temptress or we're, you know, a saint. And all of these archetypes are deeply innate be part of the human experience. Now, they're also part of the cultural experience through the vast, huge timeline of history. So going back to the days of antiquity, as we move through the entirety of our existence as humans, it's also been through that thousands of years. And it's all weaving, weaving its way through all cultures. So we see archetypes, we can find the mirrored archetype type in every culture. So we can find, you know, gods and goddesses in the Hindu tradition being mirrored in, in Christianity, being mirrored in shamanism. And you just connect the dots and think, well, these are all the same archetypes. These are all the same themes of, of our journey through, through our uh, life as human beings. Now, the archetypes can be really helpful because they help, for one thing, uh, dissolve boundaries between cultures, really, because, you know, you, especially in uh, cultural traditions or spiritual or religious traditions, people can get very much like, this is my club and this is my beliefs and we are the true people and we have this God and we have this goddess or we have this prophet. But if you were to look at them all over overview of all of them, uh, may, or some like some of the major world religions or spiritual traditions, you can find that all of these gods all represent the same thing, or all of these goddesses all have a similar message, or even the the gurus or the prophets all are the same archetype. So. In a sense, the archetypes can help dissolve the boundaries. So we realize like, oh, we're all in this together. We just have different names for these archetypal um, icons or symbols. And we can go even further and look at the archetypes as the way in which our rudimentary human experience interfaces with universal themes and energy. So as human beings, an archetype appearing, so we'll just give an, an example, like the Virgin Mary. And there's so many subsets of the Virgin Mary. We could be looking at, you know, the goddess Demeter, or we could be looking at Mother Teresa, or we could be looking at all of these varying degrees of that archetype. Well, those symbols like the Virgin Mary or the goddess Demeter, we can look at them as a way of interfacing with that universal energy or theme. But behind the facade of like this avatar of the Virgin Mary or Mother Teresa is is is, is the pure essence. And and I just think the archetypes just help to to make it succinct because we are human beings and we need to have something visual or something like an avatar that we we work with or talk to like we're like in the terms of the realms of the multiverse and consciousness we're like little babies you know like what do we do when we have babies in a crib we give them like here's like the building blocks of life we give them toys that are like here's a yellow ball and here's a, a red triangle and then we give them the rudimentary tools for them to start to develop their perception their conscious awareness or to learn so I see archetypes of are are those it's like you know nursery toys of these avatars in order for us to learn but I think what happens is we get really attached to the archetypes in terms of like that's my god that's my goddess and I worship them or, you know, but I think there's, if you're to pull out beyond and see what it really is, it's, it's something else and it's all there to learn. So that's my thoughts on the archetypes. Mm, thank you. That was great. 
yeah, I'm thinking of that film, The Never Ending Story, where there's the huge rock giant who's very sad because he says that it's all just disappearing, this imagination land that exists. And I think they were onto something because I almost wonder if what, how they manifest in the first place, I don't know. That's For me, that's kind of unclear, whether it's cosmic, whether it just simply exists in the collective tapestry of life, or whether there's also um, our capacity to project into that space of imagination and collective consciousness a particular image on a certain energy, like a deity or a story character. And therefore, that particular frequency and image becomes so much stronger and becomes even more manifested within that realm. Do you see what I'm getting at? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, everything is, we, we know everything is made of energy. And, the, and also when we put our intention towards something, it builds energy. Uh, all we have to do is go to a football match or even like a, a, a gig or a concert to see that the collective energy that people can build together is palpable. Like it is, it is really there. There's a charge there. Um, you can feel it too, even if you walk in a room just before there's a fight ready to kick off and like, it's just quiet and you're just like, something feels, you know, and then the fight kicks off. So we collectively can create energy and, and if it's directed towards something, we could probably make it come to life in some kind of way. I'll give you an example. I was in the Middle East like in 2016 and I was in Bethlehem and was walking around with my partner and we decided, oh, look at that old church. Let's go in there. That looks pretty cool. Not knowing what this church was. And as I was in there, we went off into other rooms and I saw this group of people, like a queue, a lineup of people like going down some stairs. And I was like, oh, they're lining up for something. I'm going to go check out that room too. Maybe there's something cool there. So as I joined the line and we were going down the stairs, as we walked down the stairs into this room, I was hit by this thick, intense energy that literally took my breath away. I literally went <gasps> like gasped and I felt really dizzy. I had to lean against the wall when I got to the base of the, the stairs and I was shaking, I was trembling. And I just thought, what is this place? There was a security guard there and I felt it was like electrical too. Like I felt like I was buzzing. And I said to the security guard, what is, what is this place? And he pointed and he pointed over to this star on the floor that people were going up to and bending over to kiss. And he said, that's where Jesus Christ was born. This is the nativity. This is the grotto. So I was like, oh my, I didn't even know that. I was in the church <laughs> of the nativity. But I believe that the collective energy that pilgrims, Christian pilgrims were bringing into that space towards their savior, towards the Messiah, their archetype created this intense energy <laughs> and it, mm. you know, and it's real. So we, we, we can make the archetypes alive, I suppose, you know, we create these things, we fuel mm. them with our energy and then they, they have their effect their effect is tangible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that anecdote and I would love to visit that place one day. Wow. I had a similar experience with a very different energy at visiting Anne Frank's house in Amsterdam. And oh yeah. I was in quite a good mood with my friends. We were in the queue waiting and we'd been up to all kinds of things in Amsterdam and just entering that house, you could not avoid the energy and how so many people are then moving through that space contributing to and also absorbing that energy yeah, it's very much a central co-created sense of what has been and multi-dimensional for sure so from there I'm wondering if you could speak about the art of being able to dip your toe in between two worlds you know the art of seeing through the veil between this world and the other world how has that manifested for you? 
I think my first experiences were as a child and I I remember a myst- mystical experiences growing up but I guess when I think of one I think of uh, when I was a little kid living on the commune it was in Georgia Augusta Georgia and around the the neighborhood where our community was there was all of these civil war houses you know civil war era houses big huge massive wooden houses that were you know obviously built by very wealthy slave owners back in the day and a lot of them were abandoned but they were glorious looking but they were you know de- they were decaying and i remember always going to one and it would be at a distance and i would sit under a tree and i would just look at it and i would just watch it because i would see people moving through the windows and i would go every it felt like i would go every day i mean I don't know, maybe it was every other day or, you know, when you're a kid and you're out playing and then I would make sure, oh, I'm going to go watch the people in, and it was abandoned, but, you know, and I, but I knew at that time too, I was looking at the people, the deceased people who used to live there. And that was just, just felt like a normal pastime for me. I I didn't feel freaked out by it. I didn't feel scared. I was just like, oh, those are the people who, you know, who are dead and they're, they're, they're passing through, they, they're still there somehow. And so, I don't know, I think what it is, is as a child, maybe you're more receptive to these sort of things. And then as you grow older, you move away from, oh, that could, I must have been, that, that couldn't have happened. But as I moved, as I became older, I had more and more, uh, I guess what you would say, paranormal experiences happen. And because my parents are pretty, like, they've had things themselves, I I was never shut down. So, you know, like my dad had, um, you know, he had visions before our house burned down, for example, the day before we lost our house uh, and it burned down when I was uh, 14 years old. He had visions uh, the, the the day before, like a fire all around his eyes. He had a migraine. He was like, I'm seeing fire over. I got to lay down, you know, it was like, and then the next day that happened. So whether it's hereditary or not, I, I grew up, no, you know, obviously believing in this sort of stuff. And that's when more things happened. So the more I was open, the more things happened. And, and I held all of the experiences with no fear. Don't get me wrong. I had, I had these paranormal experiences where it scared the shit out of me, where I was like, what the fuck, you know, like really intense. But then as I, as I leaned into it, I was like, okay, if you hold these spaces without fear, then there's, there's nothing to fear. Oftentimes when something creepy happens, it's only to get your attention to help out in a way. But yeah, I mean, a lot of these experiences, uh, have to do with out-of-body experiences, visitations, um, communicating with the dead. Um, Yeah, you name it, (laughs) like all the classic paranormal stuff. Um, But I don't see it as paranormal. I just see it as normal. It's sensing into what's beyond the veil, and people have been doing it for thousands of years. It's, um, yeah. Can we talk about that bardo, as the Tibetan monks would call it, which might also simply be the astral realm or many other names from different traditions. I personally feel like I have experience there. I've had several hypnagogic states where I've heard all kinds of sounds. I've had people in my room. I've received things like a radio station. And I've also had experiences where I've been able to leave my body, very much still be in my room and see my body sleeping there. And two winters ago, I had a sort of two week spell, which was quite on the more sinister, spooky side where there was a a man in my room um, that I could see once I'd left my body and I went to touch him and he felt so real. And I really thought, gosh, am I going a bit mad? And so that kind of sparked me to explore this a little bit more deeply. But can you talk to this realm and its peculiarities I know. it's so tripped out the as the astral realm <clears throat> or you know or the bardo state right like you said in, in the tibetan um you know the tibetan belief system and so when i read the tibetan book of the dead i was like wow this is really describing what you experience in a, an out-of-body experience like you experience where there's like you know there's there's entities there there's 
people there. There's thought forms that are tangible in there. So what is that? The astral plane, this dimension just on the other on the other side of this this waking reality. And it's different from a dream because you are very aware of the fact that you are in your environment. So you are you're in your room, but also very aware of the fact that you've disconnected your consciousness from your sleeping body. And often you can actually look back and see your sleeping body. So in the in the astral realm, we can come across people. So, I mean, the, the person that you came across and actually tangibly helped, touched them, I mean, perhaps it was another astral projector or perhaps it was someone who passed or someone in, in the liminal thresholds who had died. Perhaps it's it could be a thought form uh, that's being in, in you're interfacing with a, a thought form or an archetype or an idea. Like there's so many different ways you can approach the entities. Some of them feel like they are entities with their own conscious awareness and their own will. And some can feel like, uh, like I was saying, thought forms, like which I've seen in the astral where they're just like blobs of energy. They look like dark energy, like an orb or they're funny, weird shapes, like little these little mm. blob people. Like I, there's, <laughs> there's a whole list of types of entities. You can see I have several colleagues who are, doing doctorates around this and they're they're gathering information on all the different types of things you can see in the astral but i feel like we can go there to explore our consciousness and we can probably evolve our consciousness a bit there too so going into the astral plane or an out of body experience um you're probably going there to learn you know so you're probably having these experiences to learn something or to perhaps integrate something or to discover something. So I always encourage people who want to explore the out-of-body state who've already experienced a bit. You you know, I, I really believe you go places that you can handle. And often that there could be a little bit of a pull to like, hey, check this out. And um, yeah, it, it's it's funny. A lot of people experience an oh, out-of-body experiences. And although the science around it is very dubious at the moment, of course, that you know, there's been a lot of studies and people trying to come to grips uh, with empirical data around it, it still has not yet been proven by science as something that can happen. But a lot of people experience it. And a lot of people have near-death experiences that are very similar as well. And so it's, you know, it's in that real gray area right now where people feel like, well, yeah, but it's not backed by science. So it doesn't exist. It's like, well, it does exist because People experience it, and you've experienced it. I experienced it, and I'm like, I know what I, I know what I experienced. So I always say to people, like, continue your exploration. You know, wait for the science to catch up, but don't let it stop you from exploring your own mind. Your don't let it stop you exploring your own consciousness. You had the same with lucid dreaming. People have been doing it for thousands of years, just like astral projection. But people were like, no, it can't exist. It doesn't exist. And then in the 1970s, in the late 70s, it was proven by science in a sleep lab. And mm-hmm. so people are like, well, yeah, lucid dreaming, it is a thing. It exists. And so, you know, mm-hmm. I see the same with, with out-of-body experiences. It, something is happening, but we'll just have to wait for the science to catch up on that one. But keep going. <laughs> yeah, there was something that you said about the brain sort of almost becoming a radio receiver where you can switch stations and that really resonated because I've been in this hypnagogic state and I've felt like this frequency switch and my whole body's vibrating and it's very lovely and then I hear these sounds clear as day and sometimes they're sort of videos from YouTube or the voice of a radio station. I've been in Mexico and I've heard Spanish stuff come through. I've been in Ecuador and I've heard what I really felt were people talking at the other end of the land that I was that I was working on. And yeah, do you have anything to say about that? Oh yeah, I mean, it's amazing. And that what you're describing is uh, the hypnagogic threshold where you are falling, going into your sleep cycle. And what happens on that threshold is your b- brain waves change. So you're going from a beta brain wave, which is your awaking, chattering mind, and it starts to slow into a theta brain wave, which is the brain wave of, of dreams, uh, meditation, uh, flow states. 
And it's, it's in that interesting changing the channel of the radio station. And when you hit the theta brainwave, if you keep your consciousness aware, then you're able to receive like other stations other stations and what you're receiving like people go if it just feels maybe it's just gobbledygook but i've i've sat in hypnagogic late in hypnagogic meditations on the threshold so many times and i'm like this isn't just shit that i've heard like today like i'm i feel like i'm listening in on people's conversations mm -hmm. i feel like i'm hearing things that or somewhere out there, somewhere out there. And also the, the visuals that you get, like, I'm like, that's not something I saw today or, you know, this, I'm, I feel, really feel like I'm watching someone, like a remote, remote viewing. Like I saw one where someone was paying a bill. It was like, I was, I could see through their eyes there. It was really boring. I mean, like a lot of these hypnagogic imageries, it's not like you're having a mystical experience. It's just like, you're seeing really boring, details of everyday life and it was like someone paying a, a bill it was a man's hand it was like wow and I'm like I feel like I'm tuning into something you know that's out there in the collective unconscious so on that threshold state you it's incredible what can come through um, and also it's the threshold state that you can segue into an out-of-body experience especially if you're able to let the body sleep and the mind stays awake and you get the vibrations, you get the, the buzzing feeling in the body. And when you hit that really crazy high vibration state where it feels like your body's shaking and that's the, the key point in which you can let your consciousness detach from your body and float upwards mm -hmm. or roll outwards. Um, but people can't get past that because they, they get really freaked out, right? Because when you start feeling the high vibration state, some people feel like, I'm dying, I'm having a heart attack, like, because it's, an, it can, it's new sensations, yeah. it's new, it's not, yeah. you know, and it can, but what, if you move beyond the fear, it just is a breeze, a breeze after that, so it's all good. <laughs> oh, I feel so much sensation in my whole body listening to you talk about these things because it feels like total validation and it's very activating for me to hear of other people's stories and to know that this is, yeah, uncharted territory, yet it's clearly something that's real and is really being experienced by a lot of people. I would love to hear your thoughts on what you feel the healing potential is of that hypnagogic state because, you know, that full body vibrational state feels to me like a very fertile space of what is possible and we briefly spoke about this at the retreat so can you share with me your story and what potential you think it has? hundred percent. I'm so glad you brought this up. It's been like the theme of the last like three weeks for me. Um, now there's really great potential in that high vibrational state. Um, there's great healing potential. Now, of course, this is very understudied because again, no one's doing any of the lab work or the science behind this sort of stuff. But what, who brought this to my attention was a colleague of mine, Charlie Morley. He's written lots of books on a lucid dreaming from like a, a, the Buddhist perspective. And a, a couple of years ago, it was during the pandemic, he got in touch. He was like, Tree, I'm doing like, I'm collecting antidotal stories and research around people who have used that dream body energy, like in lucid dreams to heal themselves, and which is like the out of body state as well. And um, I was like, wow, yeah, I'll ask around. And I asked around and there was a few of my clients and students who were like, yeah, I've tried to do that and I've done it in out-of-body experiences. So I sent, I sent all their stories and got them talking. So anyway, long story short, just this past month, I was abroad because my sister died and um, did all the, you know, all that journeying through her death and held space for her funeral and right after the funeral I got COVID so and my whole family got COVID it was just like oh no and so I'm there with COVID and I'm thinking I really need to get better because I have to fly back to the UK to do the liminal land retreat of which you were there where I met you 
and I have to get my strength and, but I have to have a negative test before I get on the plane. And so I was really upset, you know, cause I, I was like, I do not want to cancel this retreat. And I really feel like the retreat needs to happen too intuitively. And that night after the COVID test, I was like doing dream work and I was on the threshold state. And I was like, you know what? I don't care. I'm just going to ask my lucid dream. Let's get healed up. Like or just push the sickness out of me, make it quick. Like, let's just do it. Why not? What do I have to lose? I don't have anything to lose right now. Mm -hmm. So as I was falling into sleep on that threshold state, I set intentions. I was like, my intentions are to go lucid tonight and heal myself from COVID in this lucid dream, or, you know, at least expediate it, get it out of my system so I can get onto a plane. And so as I was saying it, I was like, Oh my God, maybe I'm being like, I started getting imposter syndrome. I was like, who do you think you are, Tree? Some kind of superhero as if you're going to be able to like heal yourself. And I, you know, I started doubt started coming in and I was like, okay, okay. I will go lucid tonight and there will be a guide there in the dream that can help me, help me do this process of healing my body. So I slightly changed it. I was like, I need some help. I don't know if I could do this on my own. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I did that. I was setting affirmations and the hypnagogic, observing everything. And I went to sleep and I didn't go straight into a lucid dream, but I was having a dream and I was out on this uh, natural landscape. There was a few buildings out. It looked almost like a deserty kind of landscape. And then I noticed off to the left there was this opening, like a walled garden and like this opening. And I kept feeling like, go there, go turn left, go down that garden path, go there. And, and I just did it. And I felt myself moving through it. And I moved through and I went into this garden area. And there was just this door that was floating. A white door, it looked marble. And it had all of these carvings, intricate like design patterns on it. And it was just floating in space in this garden. And I was looking at it and it had such amazing details. And out of this carved white marble intricate patterns, this face started to emerge. And the face was also created of the patterns. And it was a man's face, a male face. And it was cut in the, in the, uh, the marble. And as soon as I saw this man's face, I went lucid. So it woke me up in the dream. And as, as I looked into this, this face, I yelled out the name Tom. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't know any, any Toms. Like in my lucid dream, I was like, I know him. Like, I know you, it's Tom. And I was like, <laughs> I just yelled out, Tom, heal me. <laughs> Tom, help heal me. And at that moment, I started feeling this incredible energy from my toes, starting in my toes. And it started, it's like that high vibrational state, like when you're in the, in the, on the threshold of a out of body experience, high vibration started going from my toes all the way up my legs, all the way up through my body. And I was like, Tom, heal me, Tom. Tom. It was like really ecstatic, totally lucid. And then all of a sudden it hit my head up to the top of my head. And I was like, slam, I was in my body in the bed. And I was still lucid, but I was in kind of like a sleep paralysis in between state. And then all of a sudden I lifted out of my body and I was out of my body and I float, I was floating above the bed near the ceiling. And then I kept saying, Tom, Tom, Helio. And then I felt this, this vibration start again in my toes and it was going up all through my body. Like it was, it was like I was being scanned. But it felt like it was pushing mm. out like my sick, the sickness or the Ill, the virus, pushing mm. it out all the way to the top of my head. And then snap, I'm back into my body again and I'm totally awake and I'm moving and I'm so hyper. It was like I received like the <sighs> biggest injection of B12 or some kind of elixir <laughs> where I was hyperactive and I was excited and I was laughing. I was like, oh, I was like, I can't even believe what's happening right now. And I felt so excited that it was really hard to go back to sleep. And I went 
went back to sleep and every all through the night I kept waking up going, oh my, I'm so excited and I feel so good and uh, crazy. So I woke up the next morning, so much energy. I, I didn't feel, uh, my fever had broke. Um, I wasn't sluggish and I, I was hyper all day. I told my mom, the because I was staying with her, I told her the dream, like, you know, Hey mom, this happened. She's like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. You know, like, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, you should try it too. Cause everyone got COVID, right? You should try it too, mom, do it. And, um, so I took a COVID test. I, I was cleared. I got on, I was able to do my flight. I had about five days, five days. And then it was, I was good to go, but it completely, I don't know. That's that was my experience with healing with this high vibrational dream body energy. I think there's great potential of healing with that high vibrational state, and other people have experienced it too. It's understudied, but we're all collecting our stories, and it was amazing. I don't know who Tom is. I've had this in lucid dreams before and out of body experiences where there's someone there. Um, another uh, person uh, that came through in an astral before, his name was Petru. And I was like, Petru, Petru, I'm so glad to see you. I was like, it, it was like, like, it's like a part of me knows these people, knows them, knows Tom, knows Petru. Mm. Don't know any Toms and I don't know any Petrus, but there's an aspect of me that knows them in those dimensions. It's so wild. It's so wild. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much for that story. It's so expanding for me. I really want to explore the healing potential of the hypnagogic state. I feel like it's a big key to what humans might be able to do for their own self-healing and empowerment. And from there, I kind of want to weave us towards your death doula work, which I'm so intrigued by. It makes me think of how visitations may come to people in their dying days and this liminal space stepping in between the two worlds that veil thinning what is it that draws you to this work and what draws you to death in general yeah so the work of of being a death doula is one that holds space for people end of life in ways that are spiritual they can be also emotional psychological and practical too so there's a lot of different uh, scope to the role but effectively the role is a very person-centered compassionate approach to all things death and dying so in our modern medical world we have plenty of um pain control and and ways of making people very comfortable with palliative care at end of life but the role of a death doula or a death midwife is there to help hold space with the compassionate, human, emotional, and spiritual aspects of death and dying. So very different from a palliative care nurse, where it's all about keeping the person comfortable, you know, the medical aspects of death and dying. So... It's a very long story how I got I got called into working with death and and dying, but I've been you know it's it it really started when I was a child. Um, it started actually with a near death experience when I was four years old, nearly drowning, and that's when I think it all started getting activated in terms of understanding death and having that vantage point of of that boundary dissolving. Uh, interconnectivity of all things and also this like oh and we also are humans here having this experience and through many synchronicities all through my life of being um, there for people at the time of death um, starting in my teenage years uh, all through my life uh, I stepped out into the role as death doula in my early 40s so um, yeah 40 about 10 years ago there's wonderful, um, life affirming experiences is very profound and sacred, but also there's all of the paranormal stuff too, which a lot of people don't really discuss a lot of the times, but you know, most hospices know this kind of stuff goes on because a lot of even palliative care nurses experience this sort of thing. Mm. And visitations can often happen. There's all always, not always, but there's usually elements of these deathbed visitations that can happen for a person end of life 
Um, usually it can come through in dreams, you know, where a dead grandparent or, or a parent comes and uh, visits the dying person and says, you know, I'm here or it's soon. Or sometimes, you know, a deathbed vision where you'll have your the dying person saying, oh, my auntie is here. And of course, no one can see but that person. And sometimes it's it's animals, you know, sometimes it's animals, visions of animals that come through animals as being the 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 guide that's coming to bring them to the afterlife. So sometimes it's mm-hmm. ancestors, sometimes it's animals, or even someone that's unknown. Mm-hmm. I was helping um, a client with the death of their friend. Their friend was dying of cancer, and in the three active days of dying, he kept seeing a woman coming into the room, a, a woman with orange lips. So it can be very different. Sometimes it's light or orbs of light. And sometimes it's just a very palpable energy where you just feel a presence within the room as well. And also people can start changing their language in around the time of death when they're getting close. So they could they can say things like, I'm going to be going on a trip soon or um, my mom is coming to get me or I'm going home soon. Like with my own sister, she was like, it won't be long now, mom. She was saying to my mom, it won't be long now, like she knew. I certainly had experiences with my own sister. It happened very quickly in terms of uh, finding out that she she was, you know, not well, rushed to the hospital and, and was declining. And, you know, these things happen hour by hour. So as I'm rushing to try to get plane tickets and trying to get over you know, I'm getting phone calls from my mom saying, like, the doctors don't think she's going to make it through the night. And so I'm I'm saying my last words to her on the phone to her, telling her I love her and her struggling to speak, but she's lucid and able to hear me. And so I had this experience where, uh, you know, it was a re- that was a really tough day because I was really trying to, you know, get over there um, very last minute to try to make it to be on on with her on the deathbed. So um, as I'm scrambling to, to get over there, I decided I need to get a hotel close to Heathrow so I can just get to the hotel now and first thing in the morning get a flight. And as I'm trying to book a hotel, I'm on websites trying to find a hotel, I really feel my sister already starting to communicate to me. So I take a taxi, I get to the hotel, I'm there that evening, I fall asleep. I wake up in the middle of the night with sleep paralysis and I've got the high vibrational state. I'm con- totally conscious and aware. Out of the darkness in the hotel room comes this cat. This cat jumps onto the bed, onto me, onto the duvet covers and starts purpying the, the duvet covers like with the claws. Like it came out of nowhere. And I'm like, whoa, 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 like <laughs> there's this cat. And I was, you know, my first instinct is like, there's this cat, what the, what? How is there a cat in this room? And then after I've, the initial shock of the situation just settled down. I was like, oh my God, it's my sister. And I'm like, I love you. I love you. I'm here. I love you. I love you. And I, I send you all the love and I'm always with you and our hearts are always connected. And I really clearly feel her say, please look after my son. Please look after him. He's 23 and uh, yeah, he's grown up, but yeah, I'm going to I'm going to look at, I'm like, of course, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there for him. I sent a text uh, to my littlest sister. And I said, this is what happened that I was visited. I really feel like I was visited and, you know, sent the text. And it's got the time too, right? That's why I felt like I needed to do that because it's got the time sent. So then I went back to sleep and uh, continued sleeping and then woke up get to the airport and I'm just about to check in and I get the phone call from my littlest sister who's told me that our big sister died. And she said she passed away peacefully. She was with mom. Um, mom was there and was had her hand on her heart and hand in, holding her hand the entire time and in a very peaceful, quiet way. And she passed away at 12.45 a.m., It was exactly the same time. I mean, I was here in the UK, but it was exact the same moment. And of course, my little sister's like, 
crying and laughing. I'm like, what, what? She's like, Tree, the last thing I said to her, the last thing I said to her was, go find Tree. She's trying to reach you. She's trying, you know, she's getting a flight. She's really trying to reach you. Go find her, find her in the dreams, whatever, however you find her, go find her. And she did, and she did. And so my little sister was crying with joy. And I'm like, she came through, she came through like a cat. I uh, got my attention and she did right at the time of death. And it was phenomenal too, because not only did I get a visitation, but my two brothers got visitations right at the same time through dreams. And my nephew, so her son got a visitation in a cool way because he was awake with his boyfriend and they were sitting in their living room and and just talking and, you know, just being with each other. And all of a sudden the TV turned on and then off. (laughs) And, And they were like, what, what the hell just happened? And then it was several minutes later that, um, my mom called and said that, that she had passed. So, so she, she came through for quite a few of us in different ways since she passed, she's still coming through. She came through an amazing way. Um, me and my dad went for a walk. We were crying our eyes out and, and I was consoling him and, you know, and out of nowhere, this beautiful green butterfly looking creature came swooping down past us and it was lime green. At first we thought it was a parrot because it was quite big. It had a long tail and really exotic looking. And we both were like, oh, wow, it's her. Like we felt like it was a visitation and it flew off. And we were like, it, it really jolted us into the present moment. I was like, what kind of butterfly was that? The next day, uh, more family was descending. My great niece arrived and she had this really amazing tattoo. And it was, I was like, that's the, the green butterfly we saw yesterday. How, what? That's a crazy, crazy synchronicity. And she said, oh, actually it's a moth. It's called a Luna moth. And she's like, the symbology of it is really mystical. In fact, if you see a Luna moth, it's considered a mystical experience because they only live for one week. And they're a great uh, uh, symbology of, of the fleeting beauty of life and to reflect on the brevity of life. And I was like, this is incredible. Like the synchronicity is like, and what it means as well. And my sister had a, a brief life here on earth, but it, it was fleeting, but it was beautiful. And, and it was great to have that message coming through these, you know, incredible animal messages. And then um, uh, th- that morning when I was saying I woke up excited and everything, I really felt my sister's presence there. And she's like, I'm going to come visit you at 12 o'clock noon. And at the time I was having a conversation with a relative. All of a sudden I saw this bright red bird, like this color of fire engine come swooping down from a tree And they said, wow, that's amazing. That's a cardinal. I've never seen one. And I went quick. I looked at the time and it was 12.01. And I thought, there she is. She made another appearance. (laughs) It was just so good. It was so good. Do you find that birds are often visitors? Like they, because in my family, we've got so many stories about birds kind of telling us when people have died or coming to give us some sort of message? It's a thing. Um, There is a great book called The Art of Dying by Dr. Peter Peter Fenwick. And I think in some of his case studies, he talks about bird visitations when someone's died and the bird just coming onto the windowsill of the hospital window right after a person's died and spent some time there you know so absolutely I've heard a lot of stories about birds uh butterflies too a lot of creatures of flight really it's interesting yeah Yeah, so cool oh I just want to take a moment to honor what you've just well what you've been going through with your sister's death and how beautiful it is to hear all these anecdotes and I'm literally getting so many goosebumps so thank you so much for sharing all of this and can you also share the synchronicity from the retreat where Eric the owner came down and 
had this an epic story about how he managed to buy this land with this magical vision of his can you share that little yeah, synchronicity? That was cool, wasn't it? Yeah. So it's the first night of our retreat at uh, Kai Mabon in Snowdonia, and it's owned by a wonderful druid called Eric. And druid Eric came down to do some storytelling and, and tell the story of how he acquired the beautiful land and started building his eco homes on the land and making this wonderful space. And as he was telling the story, he, you know, he, there were so many times he had a chance to buy this land and it never really was worked out and he never really had enough money. And he decided this one time when it came up in this synchronistic way, he's like, I'm going to try to manifest this land. It's the summer solstice and I'm going to put out a little bit of a, like a, like a, you know, a manifestation spell, so to speak, to, you know, to bring this land so I can have it, so I can acquire and do this vision. And as he was telling the story, he said that he was, this a song came to his mind and he started to sing the song and he sang the song out loud to each and every one of us. And much to the gasping of me and my partner and also a few other people who were in attendance. Now the song that he sang was the exact same song that I sang at my sister's funeral. And when I was at my sister's funeral, I did not plan to sing. I was going to do a, a one-minute silence in honor of her. And I led, every, I led the funeral. And as I led the one-minute silence, all of a sudden, the song just, it just came to me. And it was like, I have to sing this. And I started singing it. And it was a song that I heard, like, for the first time in 1986 <laughs> on a mixed tape that someone gave me. And it was a song... Uh, uh, sung by you too, and it's just a very simple lullaby. There's not even very many lyrics, and I we just could not believe the synchronicity that Eric was singing this exact same song. Uh, he sang it on a solstice, which my sister died on the solstice. He <sighs> sang it in 1986, and that was the year I got a mixtape where I first heard the song. But it's a very simple song. It's um, sleep, sleep tonight, and may your dreams be realized. If the thundercloud passes rain, so let it rain. Let it rain, rain down on me. Sleep, sleep tonight, and may your dreams be realized. If the thunder cloud passes rain, so let it rain, rain down on me. Sorry, I'm not the best of singers. <laughs> oh, no, Tree, that was amazing. I... I just think it's so deeply moving and you're such a magical creature. And <laughs> it's crazy, these synchronicities. It's <gasps> I felt just full body shivers and goosebumps and... Oh, there was such presence in the room. And it's yeah. amazing because, you know, there's so much more to this than we know and... Also, my sister being there just going, hey, hey, this stuff is, is real. Just such the blessings, you know, of the interconnectivity of all things. And just knowing that in that moment, as we journeyed into our, our dreaming group, into our retreat, it, it was so profound. Like, you know, it's up there with one of the most profound moments of my life. You know, it's like how you can't, what are the chances, right? Like you could look at it as a numbers odd, like, oh, it's just a coincidence and but come on, like, what are the chances? And it's not just that. There was tons of, there's been tons of synchronicities around it. And so 
my sister, even though she's passed, she's now a great teacher for me. She's helping me like to communicate more and to trust the amazing synchronicities that come in, to approach it all with openness, with love, compassion, playfulness, and wonder, because that that's the space. That's the space you want to occupy when you're doing this kind of this kind of work. It's not all po-faced and serious and like the, the bell tolls and like, oh, it's death and, you know, and isn't life and so serious. It's, it's totally not. It's joyous and wonderful and magical. Yes. Yeah. I, I've also lost people as many people have in their lives. And, but I, I a particular anecdote is coming to mind that I'd really love to just quickly share with you, which is I had a dear friend called George who passed away from cancer and what was we we were really intrinsically woven because I was performing with a group of five people who we went around the UK singing songs raising money for a cancer charity we had we were all cancer survivors and we're involved with this charity and supported by this charity during our diagnosis and so when the cancer came back and got him it was a real shock and it was yeah a big big grief and we were asked to go and sing the song that we had been singing on tour which is true colors and i was working in paris at the time and so i was rehearsing the song and it was really bringing up a lot it was very raw after his death and just as i get to the line at the end which is like a rainbow um this huge the most vibrant, incredible, full rainbow appeared right in front of me, right where I was looking out the window as I was singing the rainbow part. And I was really feeling George. And I I just knew in every cell of my being that it was him somehow. I just knew it was. And it was really profound and beautiful and deeply spiritual. And this makes me think of how important song and music are around death and in general what really makes a nourishing ceremony and ritual around this process, around saying goodbye to someone or around a soul parting from this earth. I know a medicine woman who says that that music and sound are the last connection a soul has with this realm with this earthly realm as they as they pass into (laughs) the liminal space between who knows right but I know that you're also a musician and I can see the cello behind you there on the hanging on the wall and I'm just curious what your thoughts are around music and sound and in general what is it that that we need in the ceremony and ritual of death that we perhaps don't have or that we need more of yeah there's something really important about it i mean they say that the the last thing a person experiences before they die is uh sound i mean that's the last sense to leave so you know, a person can be completely, you know, they're, they're really close, close, close to death, but they can still hear. So there's something about the power of sound that seems to be very important in around the times of death. But also sound and music also can affect consciousness. So we, we see it in sound baths and also um, meditations and music. And music itself seems to help bring people into a more meditative state or a flow state. So there's something to be said about the vib- the, the, the vibrations of sound or the frequency of sound that helps to slow brain waves, that helps to uh, shift emotions, like to move things. And you could see this definitely like in sound baths or sound healing people have emotional responses it seems to shift and move something within them and then also yeah the science behind the the slowing down of brain waves so that seems to be you know connected to to sound and music and and the ther- the therapeutic use of it so i think our ancient ancestors and people all over the world in times of antiquity have always used music uh drumming 
voice, singing, and sound in and around these times of, of, of ritual around death and dying. And you have lots of different examples of cultures even today that still do the practices of music or vocal lament around the deathbed, around death. And we've all used these, these rituals throughout uh, history for thousands of years. But in the West, we've lost, we've been disconnected. We've been disconnected from this because we live in a very, you know, industrialized, medicalized system. So in the West, we don't, you know, we don't grieve the way we used to grieve with these ritualistic uses of music and, and voice and sound. A good example would be like the Irish or the Celtic tr traditions of keening. And so at the time of death, uh, the w women who are holding space for the dying person would keen and keening is like a shrieking, it's a crying and it's like, it's songs that are, are sung for the purpose of grieving and releasing, cathartically releasing the grief. And part of that too is also body movements. So there's like rocking back and forth and like these repetitive movements. So that's just um, an example of that sort of tradition in uh, here in the British Isles that that still happens. Um, and there's keening groups that you can get be part of and learn how to sing the, the keening songs. But, you know, we have this also in, um, you know, in, in India and in Africa and in, in China as well, where there's these vocal musical laments and rituals in around death and dying. And of course the shamanic traditions too. So there's something to be said about the use of music and voice as being part of the cathartic release for the people who are left behind. Because death is not just a, it's not just an issue that happens for a person who's dying. It's also an issue that happens for the community. It's for all of those who are left behind. So it's, it's, a, it's a community event. It's a collective event. And so the use of song and ritual and voice can cathartically release people, which helps with the grieving process. But then there's also, it's like ascending, you know, there, there are some rituals where you're actually helping to send or, or help the, the, the person transist from this world to the afterlife. So there's very uh, particular s s songs, uh, instruments, or prayers or rituals that are associated with that through loads of different cultures from the way the Tibetan Buddhist monks hold space for people as they journey with their instruments through to um, Celtic traditions, you name it. So yeah, it's something that I love to explore. Um, not everyone's open to that kind of thing when they're in hospice. <laughs> Where there's some singing going on. Well, you see, it, it, there's been positive, the positive death movement is death positivity movement is bringing in a lot of these old practices and reuniting them. There's vibration and music and sound. There's power. Mm, thank you for that answer. That really, yeah, I really love that. Do you think it's, it, we could venture into what you feel through your experience of working so closely with death, what death might be like? Yeah, this is the big question, right? I mean, all we have to go by is really people who've had near-death experiences and what they describe when they when they died and their body died and they had this conscious experience beyond the 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 death of their body. And you know, you get the classic the classic uh, accounts of feeling like their consciousness disconnected from the body, they were floating above, or there was a tunnel or a tunnel of light, or they went to the light, or they saw dead relatives or, or, or guides, or they felt uh, a boundary dissolving oneness of all things. They felt universal love and infinity. Uh, time did not really exist. Uh, they felt an interconnectivity of all things, uh, loving presence. They felt like all of their sadness, depression, pain was gone. So these are all the hallmarks of what we might think death could be like on that transitory uh, journey. And so that's what we have to go by. But 
And from my own experiences, when I had a near-death experience when I was four, I was in the Atlantic Ocean and I was pulled out by like a riptide. And I felt the sheer gravity of the situation of being pulled out to the ocean. At that moment in experiencing that, I realized that I was much more than, than who I was. Like everything dissolved in terms of who I thought I was. I had a life review, which was only like four years, so it's not very long, but I had a real sense of my family, my, the connectivity of my family and the importance of my family and a sadness for them that they would never find my body. I had this, this vantage point of like great empathy and compassion for them. But then I also had this sense of like surrender of all things connected and this sense of like calm and peace and love and like everything's fine. At first there was a panic, of course, because it's fighting for my life to, to not drown. So I think my first experience with death was then, and I started to understand that it's, death isn't scary. And then some of my biggest teachers though around death, uh, beyond having the near death experience has been psychedelics. And so I've had some huge ego deaths and, uh, teachings about death with uh, the Amazonian psycho, Amazonian psychoactive brew ayahuasca, which is the rope of the dead or the vine of the dead. And this plant medicine is con considered to be a big teacher around all things death and dying. So in one session, I've worked with the, this plant medicine for, I guess, about five or six years. And uh, one session I had she showed me my own death. Like she allowed me to die. I died within this, this experience. It's such a long and complex story. It like, it's a whole other podcast as yeah. to what happened <laughs> because it, it, it was connected to a dream I had 10 years before, like a, not a dream, an out, out of body astral experience, but effectively she showed me the death of a person known to me. And she showed me how, what that person experienced at the uh, dying, dying. As far as I knew, like this person was alive when I went into this ayahuasca ceremony, albeit not well, not well at all. And so in the ayahuasca experience, I experienced death, which was this shocking sort of prognosis, like you're going to die and all of the layers of grief anger, pain, fear that you experience when you're being told you have four years left to live or you have eight months left to live. And then my consciousness moved to this pinnacle point of, of light that exploded into like oneness of all things. I released and accepted that my, you know, that I've died and my life was just for that amount of time and all was well. And I felt like I went beyond the human experience. Ayahuasca, which is like a, a consciousness and ex sort of talks to you during this whole experience said, you've just experienced this person's death. And this is what she felt like when she was told she was going to, she had a grave prognosis of cancer and she, and you've just experienced her death. I headed back to London turned on my phone and received a text message that that person that I experienced their death had actually died that night during my ayahuasca experience. And ayahuasca told me like, you needed to experience this so that you're able to sit and hold space for people knowing exactly what it feels like to be told you're gonna die, you have eight months to live and know what experience what it is like to experience death itself and the the oneness that you come into and the untethering that you come to from your story of the human your human story of what you were and what what you lived your life as and so ayahuasca has been my biggest teacher on on how to sit with people and i feel like that experience equipped me with great empathy and also like direct experience of what it's like. So it's beautiful, it's transcendent, but the ego death that you experience on the way towards that pinnacle point is pretty painful 
because there's fear because you're like, what, what am I? Who was I? What was this all about? We're so stuck to our story, you know, like I'm tree. This is my thing. I live here. I'm this old. I, this is my upbringing. And these are the things I do in my life. But we're so much more than this story. We're so much more than it. And when we die, we, we return to that place beyond our avatar, beyond this adventure that we had here on planet Earth. Uh, wow. I just love talking about death and dreaming. Thank you. I'm really, really enjoying this. So speaking of plant medicines, I also have a lot of experience venturing into these altered landscapes with various different medicines. And I was working at an ayahuasca center in Ecuador and the question was coming up for me a lot around how could this support people with the dying process? And I have heard a few interviews, a few resources where people are talking about this, the use of psilocybin to aid with really having a peaceful transition, you know, knowing that you're dying. So I think if I'm right, that you wrote a thesis very much on this. So yeah, what is what what did you find about the use of, of psychedelics with the dying with yeah, with death? Yeah, it's so helpful. And yeah, I wrote a thesis for my um my work in transpersonal psychology, psychedelics psychedelics and altered states with the Olive Trust. And I delved into uh, specifically the ayahuasca experience and how it can help a person prepare for death uh, psychologically. And it's, it's in a way uh, inducing or activating an ego death in order to be okay with your own physical death. And there's this um, ancient Greek saying, which is um, part of the Eleusian mystery cults, and it's called... It's a motto, and the motto is, if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. Mm -hmm. So it, it creates this whole, it's a little bit of a like mind-tingling riddle, but it, it creates this, um, you know, this idea of if we're able to have an aspect of us die while we're, we're, while we're alive, before we biologically die, then it will make the dying process much easier. And so... Psychedelics can be really efficacious when it comes to this preparation because effectively they create a boundary dissolving ego disillusion that occurs neurologically that can help give you a different vantage point towards your, your own existence. And so what happens neurologically in an ego death is that the default mode network of the human brain it it, um, it shuts down. So when we have a busy chattering mind, that's the egoic mind, we're really connected to the thoughts and we really believe them and we're so attached to them. When we have a take a psychedelic or, or drink ayahuasca, that, that filter, that default mode network just sort of like goes, you know, it shuts down. And then we're able to, to perceive things from a different vantage point. So it's almost as though and the word psychedelic means mind manifesting. It's almost as though when you take these substances or plants, your mind manifests into this other consciousness or a way of being because, because that brain chatters basically shut down. And so it really helps to get into that headspace as you are approaching death, because you realize all is well. It's the chattering freak out mind of our thoughts that keep us stuck in the loop of fear. And it gets back to, you know, all, all types of things that, that can help get you into a different vantage point from meditation to, you know, to lucid dreaming, to breath work. And also as simple as to what I used to do as a little kid, just staring at my feet and develop this sort of disassociation of like, I'm more than just these little funny toes that are sticking mm -hmm. out here. And it's, so it's a, it's a headspace. It's a vantage point. And, I, and ayahuasca and psychedelics can really help get you there. Yeah, you're really making me think of the book, The Immortality Key by Brian Murarescu. Um, yeah, it's great. I think it's, yeah, the secret history of the religion with no name. And it's all about 
this concept of dying before you die in order to not die <laughs> and that deep dive into early Latin scriptures and Sanskrit and he can even sort of pull out misinterpretations and um, questionable translations within the Bible and basically finding the root of all religion uh, essentially you could argue has has involved a psychoactive sa sacrament whether that's soma which is the unidentified mixture or something that was offering this like, deeply ecstatic euphoric experience or mushrooms or some kind of wine or a high dose of nutmeg yeah it's a great book i, I recommend it anyone listening it's fantastic and it makes you see plants and everything from a different vantage point. Plants are like our allies or guides. They're here to help open these gateways. They heal our bodies, but also to heal our minds and to bring in different vantage points. And and they're all good. <laughs> mm, I love that. Yeah. What is a common theme with people who are dying? What has been the most, you know, because I, I guide a meditation sometimes when I'm facilitating that takes people to their last few breaths to try to help them access deep wisdom from their elder self and what I'm trying to get at is what is it in people's dying days that they really care about the most what's been the most important thing in their life so what I've observed with people who are are dying is that they realize in the end that everything that is important in life has been the relationships, our relationships with others, our family members. It's all about relationships in the end. It seems as though that's a common thread. Another common thread too, that people, you know, people end up having regrets, you know, regrets that they didn't mend the bridges between people or they didn't say sorry, or they didn't say I love you or spend enough time with people. That's another thing. Another thing too is people having regrets around like the the way they spent their time, like they just worked too much or they cared too much about the material worlds. And they realize in the end, it's all about the simple, it's very simple things. And life and the nature and everyday stuff just becomes so magical for people who have a, a, a gravely pro prognosis and they know they only have two months left. All of a sudden it's the little things are like, look at the beautiful sunshine coming through the leaves of the tree. Mm. They become more present, more in the power of the now moment where they realize like, I should have been more aware. I should have looked at these, what was around me more. Why mm. didn't I, why wasn't I present? It always comes back to awareness. We are gifted this amazing thing called life. It's incredible that you and I are right here, right now, alive. It's it's like way better than winning the lottery. It's like, what are the chances of a universe that's billions of years old that we are here having this experience? So that is incredible. So <laughs> don't mm. squander it, you know? And and a lot of people feel that at end of life that they that they regret that they weren't here enough. Hmm. it's powerful <laughs> there's <laughs> many ancient traditions that advocate for contemplating death every day in order to appreciate and be more fully awake and alive so what would you say that we could bring more awareness to in our day-to-day -to, -day to cultivate that sense of amazement and awe yeah, bringing in more awareness. I, I think just more awareness and waking up in your own life is a, is a key point. But there's small ways in which you can do it. Um, specifically on the meditating on death, because when you meditate upon death, and it's not a morbid thing to do, it doesn't mean that you're suicidal or you're depressed. It's sitting with the endings and being okay with the endings. And you can look at this in very small ways every single day from, you know, just simply looking at the sunset every night, that's an ending. And, and just meditating on that ending of the sunset, just watching it go down and just say that is, there's an ending. But then knowing too that there's a rebirth somehow, mm. you know, the sun comes up the next day. So you know that there's a, 
a life, death, and rebirth cycle that that circulates through our our lives constantly, through nature constantly. So meditating on death, being okay with the little endings, and you can find the endings in everything. It could be from losing your mobile phone to missing the bus and not letting it get to you, you know, just be like, okay, well, that ended, it didn't happen. So something else will emerge. So there's, you know, it's like the art of non-attachment, which is a very like Buddhist Eastern philosophy, but there's a lot of wisdom in that. Um, letting things, uh, you know, move through their cycles, just like our own bodies will move through the impermanent, you know, cycle of life, death, then rebirth. So these are just little ways in which you can. The thing is, when you when you re reflect on death and you do these little practices, you live better. You you mm. you take every moment as like this is amazing. It also it makes you feel like life's too short to have these grudges. Life's too mm. short to have these dramas and these problems with people or holding yourself back from what you really want to do and who you want to be and where you want to go. Shine, shine out. You have this one life to just be here to, wow, experience this amazing lottery that you won. <laughs> you mm. won it. You won it. Celebrate, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, Tree, you're amazing. I think it's so incredible what you're doing in this world and your stories and your wisdom. And Aww. I could just keep asking you a million questions, but I feel like we already have potentially a two hour podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would love to plug all of your incredible things that are available and accessible for everyone. I know you've got this book that you're also raising the funds for, which sounds super interesting. We didn't even touch upon the tarot. I kind of wanted to, but you know, another podcast, another yeah, time. We could do a whole podcast on tarot. And yeah, let's do magic. that. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, do you want to just list off quickly kind of how people can find you and what you have going on I'll make sure I link everything yeah everyone can find me on Instagram that seems to be the place these days just simply tree underscore car I also have a YouTube channel I need to put some more videos up there um and then I've got a bunch of books that I've written I've got a book called dreams another one called conscious dreamer another one called the artist oracle and I'm raising funds right now for Arcana, which is all on the Rider Waite tarot deck and a real diving in for people to really get to know the deck. It's effectively a, a master class, but turned into a book. And I'm currently writing a book this just now as well on magic and ritual and spells. So that will be out next year. Amazing. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Ronnie, for having me on the show. I hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as I did. You can win a copy of Tree's book, Dreams, How to Connect with Your Dreams to Enrich Your Life, by sharing this episode on social media and tagging both Tree and Rooted Healing. That's at Tree underscore car, C-A-R-R, -R, and at Rooted Healing Co. on Instagram. And our podcast patrons, thank you so much. You have been gifted access to Tree's incredible workshop, Death and the Psychopomp. You can become a podcast patron from £1 a month in exchange for a plethora of exclusive content from our guests and our Rooted Healing community, along with event discounts and additional giveaway competitions. You can still sign up to become a patron and be in a chance to win Isabel Chu's breath cards as well as we spoke about in our last episode. You can find Tree's body of work at luciddreamtree.com and follow her on Instagram at tree underscore car. Her books and other offerings are linked in the show notes. We have a deep, nourishing dive into the wild feminine next month in Italy called Deep Remembering. It is a ceremonial gathering for women to explore their inner seasons, elemental wisdom, feminine archetypal stages of life, and how to truly harness our innate creativity and medicine that we can bring into this world. It is a powerful initiation through a portal into a new way of living and sharing. 
We will also be sharing the medicine of the child spirits, Nino Santos, which you can learn more about at rootedhealing.org slash deeprememberingthe You can also join us at Animate Landscapes in the UK from the 16th to the 18th of September, also next month, for a ceremonial weekend of deep nature connection, ecological workshops and talks with special guests Sam Gandhi and maybe Bruce Parry, who is in the process of seeing if he can join us, so fingers crossed. Learn more at rootedhealing.org slash Animate Landscapes. I'm your host, Veronica Stanwell. Feel free to connect with me personally at Veronica Stanwell on Instagram and sign up to our newsletter and explore everything that's going on at rootedhealing.org where you'll also get special newsletter discounts to our events. Thank you so much for being here with the Rooted Healing community. Mm -hmm.